This is a Rockwell RC33 planer that I bought in 1984, so it's over 35 years old. First and most important thing, unplug the machine. I like to leave the plug visible so that I know it's not been accidentally plugged back in. And I also like to do a test to make sure I've unplugged the right machine. I'll show you here how clean my floor is. It's never been this clean ever. And the reason I did that is so that if a screw or washer falls, I've got a better chance of finding it. First thing we've got to do is remove the drive belts and to get to that is take off this cover. I got a little magnetic tray here so it helps keep the screws from getting lost. Take this cover off by undoing the four screws. Remove this little thing. I could roll these belts off the pulleys but there's three of them and so I think I'll be easier if I just undo the belt tension plus the tension needs to be reset anyway. Two bolts. I'll just tighten them up again. Now the belts should come off a lot easier than if I stick a quarter inch thick piece of wood in here. Turn the pulley and the blade catches on that piece and there I'm free. And before I pull the pulley off I'm going to turn it so the key is at the top. That's just so it doesn't fall on the floor. Got a pry bar that'll just fit nicely in there. Let's see what we can do. Doesn't take much force. I'll work the key out. Now we're at the other end of the machine. I want to take the this cover off. And then it's pins. And that I'm that unhooks from the pin there, so you don't have to take anything anything apart, one screw. Remove this rubber ring by pulling it straight out. Remove this ring with a two and a half millimeter hex wrench. To remove this piece, wrap a cloth around and then pry it out. The reason for the cloth is that there's a ball bearing inside, which you don't want to lose, and a spring. So without the cloth that might shoot out. With that out of the way we got a clear view of the circlip. I've got a very cheap circlip tool here. Undo this with a 10 millimeter wrench and you might need to jam your board in here to, to get something to turn against. Now we can pry this gear loose. Loosen this off with a six millimeter hex just to give the chain some slack. This gear should slide off but it's getting caught and it might be getting caught on the burr on here so I'm just going to very lightly clean that up with emery cloth. Clean off with kerosene see if she'll come. Yes. I've cleaned up this gear with the sintered bronze bearing inside as much as possible, soaked it for a couple of days in solvent, and now I'm going to drop it into some light oil so that the oil will re-impregnate the sintered bronze, and I'll just leave it there until the new cutter head comes in, give it as much time as I can. Underneath that gear I found a three millimeter hex screw. The next step is to loosen the bolts that hold the gearbox so that I can pull the gearbox out and the cutter head with it. These two holes are lubrication holes for the in-feed and out-feed rollers. I put these dowels in a long time ago to stop the holes from filling up with sawdust. And these four bolts are six millimeter hex bolts, which when they're loosened the gearbox should drop down. But I don't want the gearbox to just drop down out of control. 
So I'm going to put blocks of wood underneath to support the cutter head. So there's the blocks of wood and I'll lower so it just touches and I've got the cutter head positioned so that it's not a blade touching the blocks. I'll drain the oil out of this gearbox by undoing the drain plug and there actually is some in there. There's a fill plug on the other side. I'll take that out as well. Taking out the fill plug got it flowing a lot faster. Now with six millimeter wrench we can start loosening these bolts. The cutter heads supported by the wood blocks. If I raise the carriage that should let this piece drop and you can see it opening up there. I'm going to put the plugs back in because there's just an occasional drip of oil and I don't want it the last you know drips getting on stuff. I'll just put them in hand tight for now. Now knowing that the gearbox is free of the casting and resting on the wood blocks I can completely remove these bolts. The next step will be pulling this out and it's heavy, awkward, sharp, so get some good gloves and know where it's going to go. And it likely isn't going to just pull out because the other end of the cutter head is in a bearing. So I'm going to tap that bearing from the other side. Here's the shaft of the cutter head and the bearing. I got a soft piece of wood. And I can see the gearbox uh, moving out slightly on the other side. And there we're clear. And this is sliding on the wood blocks. The next step is to separate the two halves of this casting. And you'll see in the video how I did it. But if I had a chance to do it again, I would mount the gearbox and the cutter head in a vise as shown. I'd use two pry bars so that I could lift things up evenly and I'd have some wooden shims ready so that when I got a gap open I could put them in to keep it open and not have it close. Those are just some tips I'm passing on so that you can do a better job than I did. The gearbox cover has five bolts and it's five millimeter hex. I got a piece of plastic on the floor because I'm expecting some oil to drip out of this. I'm working my way around this seal try and open it up evenly all around. I could only get so far with the knife but there's a little lip here so I'm going to take advantage of that to tap it open. Working up to larger screwdrivers trying to bring it out evenly all around. What's making this difficult is there's a drift pin on each side but at least knowing that I know where I need to need to apply the pressure. After about 20 minutes of working that, I finally got it loose and I think I'll be putting in a new gasket. On the end of the cutter head shaft, there's a helical gear and there's a five millimeter bolt in there, which I had to tap to loosen. Tapping the back of the box to Bird wants to know the thickness of this spline before they'll make the cutter head. So I'm measuring it with digital caliper and it comes out at 0 0.156 inches. Yours may be different. To remove this bearing, I'll first knock out the gear with a 3 quarter inch dowel. Then remove this screw with a 5 millimeter hex then knock out the bearing with a one inch dowel. There was no need to disturb the rubber seal that can just be left in place. I've ordered the bird cutter head. I'm kind of out of business until that arrives but now's a good chance to do some maintenance lubrication adjustment and it's easier because better access to stuff and I don't have to worry about cutting my hand on a sharp blade. I don't keep my thickness planer in this position by the way between bench and table saw. I have it around there where I can get good runs. Uh, but I've got it positioned here simply for good natural lighting for the filming. The motor is easy to remove 
with just these two bolts, 17 millimeter. Now I've got good access to the other two oil points. For thorough cleaning, we'll have to remove the bearing. And I think I'll do that because if not now, then when? And if not me, then who? So first step is to unscrew this cap, which allows the spring to be removed and also sets the spring pressure. There's the spring. I've removed the cap and spring on both sides of this roller. Six millimeter wrench to undo the plate that holds that bearing in place. The roller feels kind of heavy, so I'll use the same trick with the block of wood to support it. Now I can raise the carriage. With the bearing cleaned up, we can see how it works. The spring sits in that recess. The oil runs through that hole into the bearing area and keeps the sintered bronze lubricated. And that'll work very well now that all the gunk is out of the way. I've cleaned up the infeed roller and the bearings, but before I reinstall it, there's a few other things to check. Like these anti-kickback fingers, just to make sure they're all moving freely and they're reasonably clean, so I'm gonna leave them alone. If they were gummed up, there's a set screw under here you'd loosen push out the post and then take it apart and clean them up. Another thing to check before the infeed roller goes in is this chip breaker. Making sure it's smooth, which it is, and flat. It's flat this way, but when I come around this way, I don't know if you can see it, there's a gap forming, a gap forming at this end and that's because there's a dip down here and it's not bent in any way that I can see. So what I'm going to do is file that down to get it straight. I've got a fine file with tape on the end so that I only remove material where I want to. And checking frequently with the straight stick. It does not take a lot. Almost perfect there. I cannot see any light. That's a great improvement. Something I've been living with for 35 years and didn't know it. For bearing lubrication, I'm just going to use 3-in-1. It's a very light oil. And I'll get started with some in the bearing. And then that'll be supplemented with more in the pot. When cleaning up the bearing, the important surfaces are the two sides, of course, in here, and then these two sides here, because this has to slide up and down on the spring. So for that, I'm just going to use some lithium grease, something that'll last for a long time. And it doesn't have to be like a great friction reducer because this thing doesn't move much, but we just don't want it to ever bind up, protecting against corrosion. I've greased the other bearing the same way. And now I'm lowering the carriage down to bring the bearings into place and making sure that both ends are going the right way. Now we can start supporting the bearing with the plate. I'm going to leave the springs out for a while. That allows me to fill the little oil pocket up and watch it over time drain down and saturate the bronze bearing. And I can give the axle a spin to maybe help that along. That spins much nicer than it did before. So we've done ourselves a favor there. This is a threaded rod that goes all the way through to lock these two posts. There's another one on the other side, handle on this end, which locks these two. And I'm just going to take them out because they're probably all gummed up. And now is as good a time as any to clean them. There is the gooey rod. So I'll clean that up, I'll clean in here, and that'll make a better action when the handles tighten to pull both sides in snug. I'm on the other side now. I've got the rod all cleaned up, and you can see there's a flat spot on there. 
and that will go against the post in here. That's how it locks it up. So it'll go in uh, this way with the flat spot over there. I'm going to put a little lithium grease on there. Back on the handle side we have a similar arrangement except this piece is not attached to the rod. It floats freely with the bevel that goes against the shaft and the other piece that goes inside. Now if that isn't centered then just grab the chip breaker bar and get it centered so that this piece can go on nicely. Yeah. To adjust the bed rollers use a three millimeter Allen key to loosen this screw and then turn this with a flat screwdriver to raise and lower the roller. I've set my rollers flat with the table because I always use the jointer first before I pass a board through here and I'm almost always working with hardwoods and they would slide over this very nicely without the rollers. In fact some more expensive thickness planers don't even have rollers. If you need to remove the rollers because they're rusty or something and you want to clean them up you'll have to find a metric machine screw that fits in there and then pry it out with a pry bar but I'll tell you it's going to be very hard. I did try that on this machine and I was only able to get one of these open because they fit into the bearing in the end of the roller and they're just press fit. Underneath here you can see the chain that moves the carriage up and down. This is the tensioning gear and in the corner underneath each post there's a gear that spins the threaded rod in the post. These gears have 10 teeth and one full turn of the gear raises and lowers the table by 4 millimeter. So one tooth would change it by 0 0.4 millimeter since there's 10 teeth, which is 16 thousandths of an inch. So if the carriage is uneven, you can raise or lower any post by 16 thousandths of an inch by loosening the chain and turning this gear one sprocket and then tightening the chain back up. There was a lot of gunk on this chain before I cleaned it and unfortunately grease attracts sawdust and it soon becomes not a very good lubricant it's just mostly sawdust. So what I'm using as a chain lubricant is this DuPont chain saver which gets excellent reviews from the motorcycle people on the internet because it does not attract dirt. Dirt doesn't want to stick to it and what it is is you spray it on the chain let it harden for 24 hours and it leaves a hard wax uh, Teflon filled surface on the chain so the chain isn't at all sticky. I cleaned the buildup of grease and sawdust on these rods with uh, toothbrush rags and whatnot right down to the bottom there that was just completely full of uh, sawdust caked grease and then I sprayed it with the DuPont chain saver and let it run down in the bottom because there's a bearing surface down at the bottom which carries the weight of the carriage. The owner's manual gives the dimensions of a block to be made for use in leveling the carriage, setting the height of the outfeed roller and setting the height of the chip breaker. And the block looks like this when it's done. To check that the carriage is level, place the block so it just touches the carriage. But instead of coming down the way I did there, go below and then come up. The reason for that is when you're raising the carriage, you'll get all four corners rising evenly. So there that's just snug, you can see, pretty, pretty parallel. And now I'll go around to the other side. On the outfeed side, I can see that the carriage is four thousandths of an inch higher than the infeed side. Now I'm going to have to live with that because if I turn the sprockets even one tooth that would change the height by sixteen thousandths of an inch. So if I've got anything uh, less than eight thousandths of an inch I'm only going to make it worse by turning the sprocket one tooth. I'm happy that it's parallel this way and the other one's parallel that way. This, this direction doesn't matter so much. I cleaned this surface up as much as I could with solvents, but there's still something on there. So I've got a piece of 320 grit wet dry silicon carbide sandpaper. I'll put some kerosene on it 
and just see if I can lap this surface to be a little cleaner. The sandpaper is on a piece of plate glass which is dead flat and I've cleaned the glass so there's no bumps or anything between the sandpaper and the glass. So that's after five minutes of lapping. I'd probably be a little faster if I used maybe 220 grit. So there it is as cleaned up as I'm going to get it. You can see some scratches here and that's the result of me not putting tape on the screwdriver and pry bars that I was using earlier in the video. So learn from my mistakes. The other half of the casting has all these gears in it. I don't want to remove them because they're pressed quite tight into the casting. So what I'm going to do is use the fine side of a Norton sharpening stone with a little kerosene and just see if I can clean off that varnish or whatever it is. Staying flat on the casting. And this is a flat oil stone. I've, I recently flattened it on a piece of glass. So that seems to be working. I don't want to overdo it. Okay, I think I'll stop there. It's not as shiny as the other half, but it's better than it was. The bird head arrived, and I'm gonna wrap it with this piece of a brown paper bag for two reasons, so that I don't cut my fingers and so that I don't chip any of the carbide teeth. And I'll leave that paper on until after the head's installed. One thing I want to check is whether this spline fits the gear, and it does very nicely. So my measurements were correct, and Bird's machining was correct. The gasket didn't survive the disassembly process, so I got some gasket material from Amazon. It's 1 64th of an inch, and it actually measures two thousandths of an inch thicker than the old gasket, so that's close enough. And I found that an ordinary paper punch is the same diameter as the holes in here. The gasket material comes in a tight roll. To get it flat, I used a steam iron. I'll start by tracing the casting with a fresh blade. I've got the gasket taped and I've marked with pencil where each of the holes is approximately. And with the ball end of a Allen key, and it's an Allen key that's just slightly larger than the hole so it won't poke through. I'll make a depression and it'll find it naturally, which I can then punch out. So that's just to give me a location. It's good to punch these holes before the center of the gasket is cut out. I've marked a line 5 eighths of an inch in from the edge, which is the same size as the old gasket and enough to completely cover the the first gasket I made got kind of beat up, so I just made another one. I ordered the bird head with bearings included. One of the bearings is installed, that's on the pulley end, and the bearing on the gearbox end is not installed because it has to go in from the inside. So I've cleaned out this hole really well. Don't want anything getting between the bearing and the rubber ring in there, or anything binding as it goes in. I turned a piece of wood down to 1.83 inches, could probably just use a square piece of wood. Or hexagonal or whatever you can cut with a bandsaw or whatever tools you have. It's important to be applying the pressure on the outer side of the ball bearing, not the inner side, because that could damage the bearing. Now we can put in that screw and washer that holds the bearing in place with a five millimeter hex key. The next step is to tap the gearbox bearing onto the shaft. So I've got the shaft supported by a block on the floor and the vise here is hardly clamping that. There I've gone as far as I can by hand and I cleaned these surfaces beforehand. 
use the smaller one inch dowel because I only want to tap the inner part of the bearing because that's where the force is going to go through to the head. Takes a few blows, it's moving a little each time. And I'm supporting the other end of the casting here so I don't put stress on the shaft. When the spline is protruding above the bearing by about 40 or 50 thousandths of an inch, then it's fully seated. And I had to cut a slot in my one inch dowel so that I could continue hammering that down. Apply the helical gear. That sits in there nicely. And tighten up with a five millimeter wrench. It's time to put the two halves of the casting together with the gasket. And in preparation for that, I tapped down on all these bearings to make sure they were fully seated into this side of the casting. Uh, these two bearings were very smooth. This one was rough, so I replaced it. I'll be applying the gasket to this half of the casting because it has to be maneuvered in to get over those gears. And I wouldn't want to have to do that when it's already stuck to the other half of the casting and it can't bend. The manufacturer of the gasket sealant, Permatex, and make sure you got it getting a sealant, not a gasket former. A gasket former would be if you aren't using any gasket. So the manufacturer recommends cleaning the surfaces with brake cleaner fluid, so I'll do that. Make sure you go around each hole. I've got these uh, drift pins partially inserted, so that'll help with alignment of the gasket and the castings when they go together. I'm spreading this as thin as I kind of can. This is Permatex Aviation Liquid Sealant number 3H. And I'll also do the side of the gasket that will mate against that piece of the casting. Methyl hydrate's a good cleaner for getting it off where you don't want it. The instructions suggest to leave that for a few minutes until it gets a little tacky. Okay, that's a good five minutes. There's the pins to help with the alignment. Methyl hydrate to stay clean. Brake cleaner. I've adjusted the support system under the bench so that this piece of the housing rests directly on the bench and that'll make it much easier when the other half of the housing is pressed down onto it. Make sure every hole is completely surrounded. Okay, that's had five minutes to get tacky. Moment of truth. So that's not gonna drop straight down because the bearings have to be pressed into the bottom casting. But I think I've got them all oriented by sort of wiggling here, and this is parallel with the bottom casting. <laughs> Trying to keep things parallel as we go. I think the first thing to do is drive these drift pins in because they'll make the final alignment. And I had them protruding slightly before as I mentioned earlier so they were already kind of pre-aligned. The five bolts with the five millimeter heads I'm not tightening any bolt completely. I'm going around and progressively tightening. 
methyl hydrate to clean up. Do this clean up before it dries because it's much harder to remove once it dries. And the manufacturer recommends 24 hours drying time. Because the methyl hydrate completely removes any oils from the metal, I'm just going to wipe this down with some light oil so that it doesn't start going rusty. I'll leave the gearbox in this position for a few hours because just as the sealant squeezed out on the outside, it probably squeezed out on the inside as well. And if anything is going to drip down, I'd rather it drip down into the bottom half of the casting where there's no gears rather than if I tip it on its side it might drip onto a gear. Before the gasket sealant sets hard check to make sure the cutter head rotates smoothly. If it doesn't maybe the gears or something didn't mesh properly and it'd be easier to get this apart again before the stuff sets. Also as this rotates the uh, main shaft here should rotate slowly. Got the cutter head still wrapped in paper resting on the wooden block. Make sure the other end clears the carriage. I think I should be up here. I'm tapping this gently so as to not damage the bearings. I only want to go in far enough to catch these screws. Okay, that feels about right. These screws aren't binding. That's a six millimeter hex. I'll tighten them in sequence a little at a time. Raise the carriage to remove the block and the cutter head moves freely without catching on anything so I can safely remove the paper. Check that the cutter head is parallel with the table. It's always better to raise the carriage than lower it when you're doing precision measurements or precision cuts because when the carriage is raised it registers on all four posts evenly. And I've adjusted the carriage so that I'm just skimming the top of that block with the cutter head as I as I turn the shaft and I'm getting the same skimming feeling at both ends. That's good. It's parallel. If you do need to adjust the cutter head it should only be a few thousandths of an inch. Uh, if it's more than that then you'd work at the chain on the bottom as I showed earlier in the video. To move this end of the cutter head down loosen the bolts at the top and slip some shim stock in here. To raise the cutter head up you'd have to polish off some of the surfaces there. The other end of the cutter head is set in the bearing so there's no way that can be adjusted. I'm refilling these pockets with oil while they're visible because later the gear will be on top then it's harder to see. When the spring goes in make sure it fully seats in the pocket and that may require a little nudging. You can also see from the top a spring that's seated and a spring that is not seated. These set the spring tension for the in-feed and out-feed roller pressure and to start with I'm just going to make them flush with the top of the casting. That's about where they were before I took it apart. If the spring tension is too high then there'll be marks on the wood as after it passes through. If the spring tension is too low then the wood will not be drawn through the machine. I've now got the carriage adjusted so the in-feed roller is just skimming the block on this side but when I move over here I found with the feeler gauge that there's a gap of about three and a half thou. So I want a lower in-feed roller at this end by three to four thousandths of an inch. The out-feed roller has a height adjustment with this screw. The in-feed roller has no height adjustment so what I'll do is loosen these bolts and put a shim in here which will effectively drop the in-feed roller down. When I got that apart I found there's not a lot of area to put a shim on but what I did find was that on both these surfaces there was a lot of paint so I polished them on emery cloth on a flat surface and we'll see if removing that gray paint is enough to drop this down by the three thou. So now the infeed roller is parallel to the table and I can confirm that 
by moving this block along and I'm getting the same feeling of friction. To adjust the outfeed roller height, first set the carriage so that it is 40 thou of an inch above the wooden block. And I'm doing that with a feeler gauge that is 40 thou thick. It's actually a one millimeter uh, feeler gauge. That's the same thickness. Then move the block to the outfeed roller and we'll adjust the outfeed roller height so that it just touches the block. And that'll put the outfeed roller one millimeter or 40 thou below the cutter head. The block is a little loose, so I'll use an 8mm wrench to lighten off on that nut and then a 2.5mm hex to adjust the height so that it's just starting to touch there and tighten up. Check again and then repeat on the other side. Set the chip breaker in the same way by loosening these nuts, turning the set screws to get the chip breaker at the same height as the outfeed roller, which is 40 thousandths of an inch or one millimeter below the cutter head. The keys go in with the round end towards the machine. And if there's a burr or something on it, you may want to take that off with a file. These two gears have to go on together, lining up the keyways. Then we can tighten up this three millimeter The shorter bolt, the 15 millimeter bolt, goes in this gear and the longer bolt, the 20 millimeter bolt, goes down here. Tighten them up with a 10 millimeter hex. Circlip. Insert the spring and the ball. That locks that in. I've had the oil plugs out up till now to let some air flow through to clear out the fumes from the gasket sealant, but now I'll put them in. And you notice I've got Teflon tape just on the outer half of the threads. I don't want any Teflon tape inside that might get washed up in the oil. And I'll tighten that just gently with the 3 8 inch wrench. Over on this side is the hole for filling and I'll be using extreme pressure gear oil as recommended in the owner's manual. I'll fill it right up till it leaks out and then put the other plug in the same way as the drain plug. A little plastic tube makes it easier to fill. And I've got a cloth there ready to catch the drips once I hit the full level. If you decide to fill the gearbox before installing it on the machine, which might seem like an easier way and it is an easier way, then be careful you don't overfill it and you can check that by removing the fill plug after it's installed and letting the excess drip out. The recommended torque setting for these screws is 45 inch pounds, which is 5.1 Newton meters. So I got this handy torque wrench from Amazon and I'm checking every screw to make sure it's tight in case one came loose in shipping or something. It's a T25 bit and I found out that not all T25 bits are made the same. So get a good quality bit that fits tightly. None of them were loose, but I'm still glad I checked. The foam gasketing looks pretty ratty, so I'm going to replace that. Uh, this piece is essential. This part around here is something I added years ago just to reduce the clatter of the machine when it's running. I put a thick gasket on here and just 1 8 inch weather stripping around here. If this board is damaged or missing, you can easily make a new one out of 1 8 inch hardboard. And it should come very close to the blade because it's going to deflect the chips away. There's my new deflector. The trickiest part was cutting this 45 degree bevel and I found that doing that on the rudder table and keeping it pressed down was the best way. 
before putting the belts back on, check that these two pulleys are parallel. If they're not, you'd have to adjust this pulley by loosening the motor and there's a set screw in there somewhere. To set the belt tension, loosen these two bolts using the piece of wood as a lever. Lift the motor until you get a belt tension where you can only deflect a quarter of an inch with a finger pressure and then tighten the nuts. I've got a weather stripping gasket on this belt cover just to keep the machine running quieter. I've got the planer back in its normal position and before I put the cover on I'll just do a check to make sure the chains are all running nicely. we can see a space where sawdust is going to get onto the chain. And you can also see there's a couple of little bosses in the casting. And I know that some other machines with similar architecture have a metal plate that goes on there and screws into those bosses to keep the dust out. To make it easier to drill the pilot holes for the tapping, I'll use a 17 millimeter hex wrench to remove the handle. For drilling in the cast iron, I've got a cobalt drill bit, some sulfur-based cutting oil that'll prolong the life of the drill bit. I'll set the depth of cut to be a quarter inch longer than the bolt, and that'll make it easy to tap. And I've got the casting against the post, so that if the drill bit binds, the casting won't spin around. Now I'll drill with a 9 64 inch cobalt drill bit, create the right size hole for an 8 30 second tap. I cleaned out the hole by sticking the WD-40 nozzle in and spraying it to get all the shavings out. So there's my baffles. I made them first out of cardboard, easy to cut and modify. Then transferred that to some sheet aluminum that I had laying around. You could use any material here. You could even use cardboard. The baffles have to be installed after the cast cover is put in place. And then removed before removing the cast cover. So that's a bit of a nuisance. But it's, uh, I think, worth it because it's going to keep the, the sawdust from getting into that compartment and contaminating the chain. If you click on the link in the description, there'll be a PDF file that describes everything I've done in the video with pictures and words. And at the end of that file, I'll provide a outline drawing of these. I've got the table reasonably clean. And I'll try some of this dry lube with Teflon stuff that's made for table saws and the like. Okay, I've got three pieces of wood. I'll send them through in the left, middle, and right and see if they come out all the same thickness. And I've raised the carriage to the height I want. So again, so that it registers evenly on all four posts. Those are the dimensions I get as measured with a digital caliper. They're all the same within one thousandths of an inch. This is a piece of hard maple planed on the machine with the old straight blades. It didn't matter which direction I fed it in, I would get a lot of tear out because the grain direction keeps flipping around. And this is probably the worst example I have of using the straight blades. In most cases it comes out much better. So let's see what happens with the new bird shellex head. And I'll try going in the other direction, but already a big improvement. So I think it's about the same. You know, a little in here, that's a really tough area, the way the grain's going. But before I had tear out all along here, and now you can see that's exceptionally smooth. And the whole panel feels very smooth. A handy trick to eliminate the snipe that you might get at either end of the piece of wood. And you can't see it there, but I can certainly feel it with my fingers, a few thousandths of an inch, is to run the wood through on a flat board, and that'll eliminate the catch. That's particularly true when you're planing a very thin piece of wood, like a quarter inch thick. There's one little problem I want to show you. The bed here is 13 and 1 8 inches wide, even though it's a 13 inch planer. 
and the original straight blades that came with the machine were 13 and 1 8 inch wide but the blades on the shellex head are 13 inches wide so if I run a piece of wood through right at the edge here we'll see what happens okay so you can see there it missed the last eighth of an inch I can certainly live with that I don't normally run any wood right through at the edge if I had a very wide piece that might drift over uh, what you could do if you really wanted to is before you order your shellex head ask them if they will make it 1 8 inch wider on either side as you can see here there's loads of room between the knife and the casting so those knives could be extended an eighth of an inch on either side without any problem with still lots of clearance and one more thing each row of cutters is staggered from the next row as you can see which is good but it does mean that this cutter here for example its farthest corner is about seven eighths of an inch from the edge which means if you want all the cutters to be passing over a particular part of the wood that wood needs to be in somewhere between three quarters and seven eighths of an inch from the edge of the planer now normally that's probably what I would do I don't normally send pieces of wood through up near the edge uh, but it's just something to be aware of if you're looking for the best possible cut as you might be on a piece of wood with difficult grain so my periodic maintenance plan going forward which will probably be once a year for me is to blow the dust off these chains and spray them with the DuPont chain guard blow the dust out of these riser rods and spray that with the DuPont chain guard get a couple of drops of oil on that bronze bearing in there that we saw earlier remove my little sawdust plugs and get some oil down into that bearing with a long neck oiler and blow the dust off this chain underneath spray it and get some lubricant on this bearing then check the chip breaker and the outfeed roller with the block as shown earlier in the video making sure they're one millimeter below the cutter head and parallel to the table and then there's the as required keeping the table clean keeping the rollers clean of resin spraying with the dry lube and the gearbox oil i'll probably change once every five years which is a lot more than it got done in the first 35 years